From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and yours are safe, sheltering in place in a comfortable environment. We look forward to welcoming you back in our Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. Myron Spaulding was a high school certified naval architect, boat builder, and greatest sailor of his day. He played the violin in vaudeville shows, silent movies, the ballet, and the symphony. Myron was a multi-talented genius who owned a boatyard for the last 50 years of his life. He was not money-driven. He liked learning, sailing, teaching, and the truth. With the ever-present slide rule in his pocket, Myron would make instantaneous calculations several times a day. No piece of technical information was too arcane for Spalding's encyclopedic brain. He was a measuring wizard who could calculate the buoyancy and accurately scribe the waterline of a newly designed yacht before it was ever launched. In 1925, a 20 year old Myron cut his boom two feet shorter and reduced mainsail area, declaring in starboats, flat is fast and a more important key to speed than raw sail area. His insight would prove correct, and he dominated the San Francisco racing scene for the next several decades. In 1957, as an apprentice sea scout, I was introduced to Myron by Don Fuller, first mate of the sea scout ship ranger in Aquatic Park. Fuller was a naval architect, fellow eccentric, and one of Myron's many protégés. The sea scout would buy surplus 30-foot whaleboats from the Mare Island Naval Shipyard for $1 and invest thousands of youthful volunteer hours rebuilding, sanding, and varnishing these cast-offs to transform them into racing sailboats. Mate Fuller would jumble several of us sea scouts into the cab and sometimes into the back of his pickup truck and drive over the just 20-year-old Golden Gate Bridge to Myron's yard to consult on all manner of design and construction matters. Myron would stop hauling a boat or running a table saw to answer Fuller's question. Looking back over the decades, I bet my boat that Myron never billed us a cent for all the advice he provided over the years. During the 1990s, Myron was a guest speaker at a couple of Tuesday Yachtsman luncheons, as they were then named. To introduce the most famous sailor in the room, I held up and simply read the inscription on the front of this 66-year-old trophy, which reads, Pacific Coast Yachting Association Championship Regatta, Star Class Championship, 1926, won by Myron Spaulding. The crowd roared in acknowledgement that Myron was the greatest sailor in the toughest class before most people in the room were even born. So 15 years after Myron left us, those who knew him considered it a stroke of good fortune that a thoughtful Bill Edinger had enough marine engineering success with his spectra water makers that he could adopt Myron's yard and its customer-centric spirit. Bill was a genuine sailor who began the prenatal phase of his life in a Golden Gate fluke which the family shared with cruiser of note, Dr. Chet Noyes. Bill would add to that auspicious beginning, 80,000 offshore cruising miles and a family that loves our sport as much as he does. Welcome, Bill Edinger, to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. It's a pleasure to have you as a guest speaker. Thank you, Ron. Pleasure to be here. When the center became a nonprofit, it was originally named the Spalding Wooden Boat Center. Uh, and at the time, it seemed like the right thing to do is to focus on wooden boats. Um, Myron was primarily a wooden boat designer and wooden boat builder because of the, the time. But the, um, the perception with the public was, oh, that place, that's only for wooden boat people. Um, and 
this is a community center here and it's for everybody. So um, I and the board of directors uh, made a decision to change the, the name of the organization to the Spalding Marine Center so it would seem more inclusive and, and more welcoming to people that own fiberglass boats, which, which as we all know is in the majority today. And that's why we changed the name. Being a nonprofit, we have a number of missions. Uh, one is preservation. Uh, we are here to preserve the center. We're here to preserve the works of Myron Spalding um, and also to preserve various boats and, and uh, things associated with the center. We're um, also an educational organization. We do a number of workshops and, and um, uh, classes and youth programs. Um, restoration is part of our mission, uh, although the last major restoration that was accomplished here was the Frida, which is a um, classic boat built in 1885, oldest yacht on the West Coast. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is a community center. So we invite the public in. There are not many boat yards that have a sign, you know, um, please come aboard, welcome in, walk around, check the place out. In 1915, Myron Spaulding came to San Francisco as a young boy with a good violin and an interest in boats. He designed and built one himself at Polytechnic High School. After graduation, he earned an additional degree in music, which eventually won him a seat in the San Francisco Symphony. He was a violinist like other people are plumbers. It was a trade for him and he, you know, belonged to the union and he'd go down to the union hall and get a job and go and perform. But all along, boats were his first love. Myron was a great sailor. He was the best sailor on the bay. In his early 20s, he was racing and winning several class championships sailing on the bay. And how you could see that in the racing was he was observing Mother Nature and being open-minded about how it related to the wind that might be a little different angle and the runoff that was going this way, and it would change which direction he would go. But he did it with this different background, not trying to dominate Mother Nature, trying to understand Mother Nature. In 1936, he won the Transpac race as skipper of Dorade, a 52-foot yawl designed by Sparkman and Stevens. A few years later, he opened a naval architecture office of his own, creating designs like the Spalding 33, several of which still sail the bay. One of his best creations, the 45-foot yawl Chrysopoli, has been well-maintained and enjoyed by several owners over many years. It's considered a classic of boat design. They sail like little beautiful witches. They're wonderful sailboats. And Myron was always thinking, not just the craft of the building, he wanted the boat to work in the wind and the water. He really wanted that and he yeah. achieved it. And what made Myron unique is that he was, you know, he was both a designer and a builder. He knew the practical part of doing it. And that's the best kind of designer. In 1951, he bought a waterfront site in Sausalito and built Spalding Boat Works, starting an operation that would involve many other workers, boat owners, and lovers of fine craft. There are a lot of boat builders around, but Myron is really unique in that he, he really thought about things and did them in a very, very rational, thought-through manner. I mean, everybody thinks about stuff, but he was particularly good at it. <laughs> and insisted on, you know, thinking things through. He really understood thrift and the ability to reuse things. So even a short length of line had a many uses, many lives that could be experienced around here. He was teaching theory. That's yeah. what he was teaching. It wouldn't matter if it was a wood boat, 
a cat boat, a schooner. It, we, he was going through all of it, and it would happen, like I just said, randomly. He'd be in the middle of a job, and he would go, oh, no, do it this way kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So he was an amazing gift to me of teaching me all kinds of endless things. We used to have lunch uh, together at, down at Rico's in Sausalito here. It was $2.50 for full lunch. And Myron would hold court every day at noon. That'd be six, eight, ten people at the table. And yeah. Myron would talk about the cruising club rule or the boats and the old days. And he educated his kids uh, and, and he gave everybody his knowledge. Working almost to the end, Myron Spaulding died in the year 2000. It was his widow, Gladys, who decided to create a non-profit center to carry on his ideas and way of working. She wanted a working facility. Boats would be brought here, boats would be worked on, uh, new things could happen. Over these first years, the center has built an active program of four parts, preservation, restoration, education, and community. There are always older wooden boats in need of preservation, but only a few can be restored. Frida is one of the lucky ones. Built in 1885, she's the oldest active sailing yacht on the West Coast. Frida is a joint project of the center and the Arquez School of Traditional Boat Building. Here they are deciding one of the final touches, marking the waterline. One of the educational activities of the center is a yearly class for young people initiated by Craig Southard. The idea was to create a boat building program where the kids would learn sailing and how to build a boat using traditional techniques, solid wood. Start these kids with a pile of wood is sitting over here and you say, okay, we're going to teach you all the hand tool skills and, and boat building skills to turn this pile of wood into a boat. And then you're going to take the boat that you built out on the water and you're going to understand how it works and you're going to understand the craft that went into it. And that's what we've done. We're on our fourth boat now. Barbecued oysters a la Tom. Every month we have an open house. We have barbecue and we give tours of the Spalding Center. They can see the youth program going and just walk around. Beyond the boatyard, the center also makes its presence known at events such as the Tiburon Wooden Boat Show, giving out information to attendees and sailboats to the children. classic motor launch donated to the center is used for tours of the Sausalito waterfront, which are open to the public. Wanda is a, Wanda is a classic yacht. Yeah. It was owned by Fred of Fred's Restaurant. And uh, Wilma Point Harbor. Some people call that Darth Vader. I don't know why. I do want to invite people to come to the Spalding Center to become a member and to be part of this unique place. This is becoming a, a lost art and it should not be that way. In these times people need things like this. You know, people need to work with their hands, to touch wood, to be surrounded by this piece of history. Every sailor in San Francisco Bay is indebted to Myron. Very few of them are aware of it. He taught me an attitude or a style toward work in general, uh, not anything specific. You know, it's fundamentally that it was good to do the job properly for its own sake. Not so much for the function, but because you would feel better about it. 
mean, I feel Myron's boats like Naughty Gal, Buoyant Girl, Chrysopolis should be looked at like a Mona Lisa. It was totally devoted to the art form, to the craft, to the engineering, to the whole, whole ball of wax. He believed in the truth, you know? <laughs> Not many people do. <laughs> he believed there was such a thing. That's what I liked about Myron. <laughs> Just as Myron was a man of modest means, so is the Spalding Wooden Boat Center a modest enterprise. But it needs and deserves continued support, preserving standards of quality and craftsmanship that are more and more rare in our world. Onward, Myron. So I think that's a great introduction. Um, to who Myron was, um, and um, it's it, it's an honor to um, to be here and to try to have the center uh, continue his legacy. You can see that the center is located right in the center of Sausalito, waterfront location. There is Spalding Boat Works built in 1951. How would somebody get to Spalding Boat Works? Give us give the average viewer dr driving directions. Uh, it's quite simple. Uh, we are now at, for, for years and years, the address was foot of Gate 5 Road, uh, but uh, we finally got a number because it um, turned out that the Postal Service and the uh, UPS couldn't find foot of Gate 5 Road. They wanted a number. So now we are at 600 Gate 5 Road, uh, which is off of Harbor Drive. Pretty easy to find. In the north end of Sausalito, everybody. Correct. Um, so, Spalding Bow Works is a is a what I call a boutique bow yard. Um, our crane, which is um, uh, probably going on a hundred years old, Myron bought it second hand and had it shipped out here from the East Coast, um, is only rated for twelve tons. And in Myron's day, a twelve ton boat was a big boat. Um, and, but now um, boats have gotten bigger; they've gotten heavier. Um, so we are somewhat limited in our capacity by the, the crane. Um, so um, it, it limits the number and the size of boats that we can haul, and we don't have a, a lot of space. So as I say, we're a boutique boatyard, but the crane is in great shape. It gets uh, certified every year. Um, and it's also very useful because it's used for uh, pulling masts and restepping masts. And, uh, um, that's a good bit of business as well. The wonderful thing about Spalding Center is this numbers of uh, old machines that are still perfectly functional. Um, you can see the planer on the left hand side. Uh, I believe that that was um, from Anderson and Cristofani. Um, um, purchased years ago. And as you can see, the drill press on the right is well over 100 years old and perfectly functional condition. I can still hear that planer, the sound of it, that wild <laughs> It's loud. It is indeed loud. Uh, this is Arite, a 28-foot uh, Spalding design that was built here at the center. And above her are the molds for Arite, which uh, we're just sort of hanging around collecting dust. And so for, for the ambiance, we um, painted it and, and uh, assembled it and hung it up in, in the ceiling there. We have a phenomenal library. It's unfortunately underutilized because maybe a lot of people don't know it exists, but we have literally thousands of marine publications of all sorts and types. And we are continually getting more donations of books and Often we have duplications, which we're happy to sell when we have events and that sort of thing. We also have Myron's Yachting Magazine collection going back to the 30s, which is fun to come in and peruse on occasion. Um, you have to be aware that you're gonna have to dust a few of them off before you can read them, but they're here and 
and everyone is welcome uh hopefully when we get over covid to come in and borrow a few uh fine books um, this is the casting pattern for um, the keel of Grisofli. Um Again, another artifact that was sort of collecting dust here, and we so we uh, brushed it up and uh, put a little coat of sealer on it and uh, put it out for people to see. Um, this is uh, one of Myron's tools. As, as mentioned in the video, Myron was a yacht measurer. Um, and he would measure the uh, stability of boats. And he used what I call his uh, whiskey bottle um, stability gauge. And he would attach this to some place on the boat that would be horizontal, like a uh, bowsprit or something of like that. And, and then he would hang weights on one side of the boat. And he was using this, he was able to measure the stability of the vessel. You can see on the right hand side is the whiskey bottle he put water in. <laughs> um, we also have a collection of Myron's trophies hanging on the wall. Um, as you know, or mentioned earlier, he was a fabulous uh, yacht racer and he collected his fair share of trophies. The picture on the right is what we call navigation of Myron's time. Um, a lot of people don't young people particularly don't know that navigation took place with a sextant and a compass and charts and uh, so we have a little display there and you see a, um, a lead line at the bottom and there's also in the cabinet a um, walker log which uh, was used to measure um, distance over through the water distance through the water where the term knot meter comes from <laughs> indeed um, this is a bit of Myron's office, and we still have a number of Myron's books and artifacts uh, in the office, which is where I'm speaking from today. Um, as you can see, uh, some of Myron's hats up in the top left-hand corner there, um, all preserved for posterity, I guess. There's toolboxes at the bottom. When I arrived, um, I was astonished to find boxes and boxes and boxes of Myron's casting patterns. In his day, the, the selection of marine hardware was probably pretty slim, and he chose to design and manufacture a lot of it himself. Um, so I pulled these patterns out, and you can see in many cases there's a pattern, and next to it is a, um, a uh, rough casting. So Myron would design these patterns send it out to a pattern maker uh, pattern maker would build the pattern which was a essentially a work of art and myron would have the parts cast and then finished machined and installed on a boat these are now um, being displayed in nice cases up on the wall because they're as i said they're essentially works of art Frida was, re was restored here over a, a number of years. Um, oldest yacht on the West Coast. It was a substantial project. Um, and it would, wouldn't have happened without a tremendous amount of community support. She's sailing on the bay as, as we speak. She's, we take her out on Master Mariners and um, we do community sales. And so people are welcome to get in touch and sign up for a, a sale. Of course, the um, as soon as COVID is passed, we'll be a lot more active in the community department. We run a number of educational programs, um, but one of the greatest is the youth programs to get kids working with their hands. And um, we, we generally run in the summertime, like summer camps, and kids will build toolboxes, skateboard decks, uh, often we uh, build a canoe or a kayak, um, and it's it's a great program. The kids seem to love it. We've been doing this ever since the center became a nonprofit, essentially. 
We also run a number of adult boat building programs, and this is a fine skiff that was built by a, an adult group. Um, we were, we've been running these consistently, and unfortunately, um, COVID kind of shut the program down, but we're getting ready to restart it. And in um, uh, April, we'll be having a, uh, uh, a week or a four day program for adults, and they can come and build a kayak or something similar. Another project we've undertaken recently is we call it the Pelican Project. Um, the Pelican is, is designed um, back in the 50s by uh, William Short. It's a very popular bay class, but it's also an ideal boat for youth, what we call youth adventure sailing. And many yacht clubs and many organizations have got sailing programs, which is great. Getting kids in any kind of boat is a wonderful thing. But we wanted to have a program oriented more toward not to racing, but what we call adventure sailing. It's getting in a boat and, and getting out on the water and being free and sailing off to a destination, possibly Angel Island for a picnic and that sort of thing. So um, we're in the process of building six of these boats. And we have taken the design and updated it. Um, the fellow in the picture is. Uh, actually a yacht designer who works here and uh, he worked for Sam Devlin up north and um, we have redesigned the Pelican to be built in a stitch and glue method which is a more modern construction um, and it's, it's going to accelerate and shorten the build time. What is the build time these days typically? How many hours? Um, this boat is the prototype boat and it's not quite complete. Um, I think we'll have about 150 hours uh, total when it's done. And thereafter the build time to build each new Pelican, what do you guess? <laughs> we're hoping to be, we're, we're hoping to be closer to 100 or 120 hours. Mm -hmm. And we're basically lined up a whole slew of volunteers who will come in and help. And so we'll be building them in a production line um, method. Um, we're hoping to start building the next five boats within about um, six weeks. And typical cost of materials, what's your estimate of what cost of materials will be for a Pelican? We've, uh, we've budgeted uh, about $35 to $3,800 per boat. Mm -hmm. And um, a very generous donor, Bob Bernheim in Tiburon, has donated uh, the entire cost of the materials. So it really takes the strain off the project for us. It's a wonderful thing. Do you have a description for people who haven't been on a Pelican dimensions? It's um, 12 feet long and about five and a half feet wide. Mm -hmm. And draws about 25 Probably. inches? Yeah, I would say. One of the many educational activities we do are workshops. This is a painting and varnishing workshop. Um, this was done by Patty Swenson a couple of years ago, but uh, we invite the public in for a day long um, program. And we generally s supply, you know, coffee and lunch and that sort of thing. So we've had these in um, painting and varnishing, um, We've done uh, electrical, we've done plumbing, uh, we've done Marlin Spike seamanship. Um, and as you can see, some of these are very, very well attended. Uh, this is Clark Beak doing um, marine electrical, um, very well attended program. As a community center, we've done, la we've done launchings, we've had weddings, um, we have done fundraisers. Uh, we had a very nice fundraiser um for commodore tompkins when his boat got hit by lightning um and so it's great to have the public come in and see the center and and be part of be part of what's going on here uh, one of the other things we've uh, been doing the last couple of years unfortunately it's shut down by covid but we invite a group of developmentally disabled adults in and uh, we um we all get together and um, paint the deck or um, do some maintenance around the place. And um, it's, it's quite fun, actually. So they'll come in 
about once a week and spend a, a good half a day. And um, um, as you can see, it's a jolly crowd. A couple of years ago, um, we built a, a boat for uh, develop for disabled sailors called the SV-14, um, designed by Alexander Simonis. And the idea was this, there are a number of boats available for disabled sailors, but in general, they're a little bit on the clunky side. And his idea and concept was to build a boat that was really fun to sail and, and uh, a, a good performing boat, but designed to um, be sailed by people with um, disabilities. So there um, was, you know, we have um, tilting seats so that the person can be sitting more or less upright. And then, of course, um, uh, actuated steering and uh, that sort of thing for those that uh, don't have use of both hands. And that, that was a, a great project. And is this was um, donated to this boat was donated to BADS Bay Area Association of Disabled Sailors. Unfortunately, I was out of town during this. It was a great party. I'm sorry I missed it. One of the other things we do. So that was the, that was the fishwives, and that was a uh, part of our speaker series, which are evening programs. And um, fellow on the left, the smallest Bay T-shirt, just gave us a a, a a lecture on sustainable seafood, and he actually runs a sustainable seafood business. But um, they also uh, have a little musical group called the Fishwives, and uh, so I thought I'd just throw that in at the end. The reason we're ha having this conversation today is to tell you a little bit about BoatWorks 101. When the center became a nonprofit, I advocated that this re should really become a vocational training center. Um, when they first um, started the organization, they actually um, spent some time speaking with IRIS, International Yacht Restoration, about starting a West Coast chapter. And unfortunately, that um, transaction never occurred. And uh, so we don't have an in-house, uh, we have not had an in-house vocational training program. And that's what we've always, that's what I feel we should have and what we wanted to start. About six months ago, I became associated with a, uh, a retired lifelong educator, a fellow that started and run many, many schools and had the expertise to make this project happen. And um, we started to put together the program and to 
think things through and um, created this program that is going to be starting in this coming late summer, early fall. The reason uh, Boatworks 101 is innovative is that there are numbers of um, apprenticeship programs. As you know, the, uh, the electricians and plumbers and uh, uh, various trades have uh, vocational training and apprenticeship programs, but it's focused on one area. It's focused on electrical or plumbing or whatever that one trade might be. Um, our intent with this program is to train the apprentices in a wide variety of expertise of, you know, electrical plumbing, uh, woodworking, um, because a marine service technician needs to be a little bit of everything. He needs to wear a, quite a number of different hats. This slide shows that the recreational boating industry is not a small industry. Um, in California alone, it's, it's essentially a $13 billion industry. Um, and annually, or in um, U.S. boating, it's um, huge as well. So what I've seen over the years is that many of um, the workers in the industry, the people that are been in it for and are experts, are all aging out. They're like myself, where um, when I came into the industry as a marine technician, there were a lot of other young fellows who were working alongside me and and um, working in the industry at the same time. And now we've all we're all got gray hair and we're aging out. And there's not very many young people coming in. And so um, there's a dire need for new workers, young workers who can fill the shoes of the people who are aging out and retiring. Um, there's been over the years, or recently in the um, recent past, you know, a focus that every young person needed to go to college. And so a lot of young people are going to college and they, they get into um, uh, horrendous debt and they come out and there may be good jobs, there may not be. Um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot to be said for thinking about going into the trades. Um, you can make a good living, uh, it's extremely satisfying work, and um, uh, it, it can be a good long-term career path. And I think that there's, we're starting to see in, um, uh, a return or a resurgence in apprenticeship programs. When we started this project, we looked at a number of models. And as, as you may know, uh, there's a number of schools, uh, there's internet, International Yacht Restoration School um, back east. There's a landing school back east. There's a Northwest School Boat Building up in Seattle. Um, and they're all fabulous organizations, but they're schools and they re require tuition, which is quite expensive. With an apprenticeship, apprenticeship program, um, the young workers are going to get paid. Um, which means there's no barriers to entry. They don't have to have money or they don't need to borrow money to apply. Um, so that's one of the main reasons we chose the apprenticeship program. There's no barriers to entry. Um, the other thing, it's a very effective, you know, training method because the young people are going to be working alongside our yard workers and um, um, they'll be able to see how things are done and they'll be able to get their hands dirty and actually um, learn what we hope, um, learn to be good craftsmen. Weiss Balding Center, well, I think this is kind of obvious. Um, Myron instilled a, a sense of craftsmanship about the place. Uh, we've got history um, and we've got uh, community, community support. And also we have a good um, number of skilled um, craftspeople who are gonna be our uh, teachers and educators. And we've gotten a phenomenal support from uh, other ver various businesses uh, and people who wanna come in um, and uh, help do one to two 
several day workshops and we have some re re excuse me we have some retired uh, people who have been machinists and welders they're going to come in so the um, the young people are going to get a wide range of experience from a wide range of people we're going to be training them in, in a number of different disciplines we're going to be training in, First of all, they'll come in and it'll be sort of a little bit of a boot camp. You know, when we started speaking to our partners, our, the people who are going to be uh, working with us in the industry, um, we said, well, what do you need in a worker? What are you looking for? And one of the first things they said is, we need workers that know how to work. So young people who uh, need to come in, they need to be focused. They need to put their phones away, um, and they, you know, they need to learn how to work, show up on time. And so it's going to be a little bit of a boot camp uh, to start out. Um, they'll be learning how to use tools safely, running power tools, hand tools, sharpening tools. Um, they're going to learn a little bit about woodworking. Um, because even an electrician, a boat, a marine electrician needs to be able to cut a hole in a panel to, to install a radio and that sort of thing. We're going to be running them through propulsion, engines, um, how to align an engine, you know, how to uh, uh, repack a packing gland, all these sorts of things. Plumbing is important. You can't, you can hardly do a thing on a boat without, um, you know, putting pipe fittings together and hose and, you know, if you install a bilge pump, that's all plumbing. And electrical, if you're installing a bilge pump, it's electrical. So you need to do, a, you need to know quite a bit about electrical and you're going to need to learn a little bit about troubleshooting. Um, these people will be covering, um, learning about rigging and, and marine systems. So it's going to be a wide range of uh, training. Um, we're basing our curriculum on the American Boat and Yacht Council curriculum. This is something that we were able to purchase off the shelf. And um, they have a full range of, they have an excellent textbook and a full range of uh, videos and PowerPoint presentations, which we can draw from to build our own curriculum. One of the more esoteric but and hard to convey uh, things that we need to train or teach is craftsmanship. Craftsmanship is, is a uh, esoteric but important quality. And I, th I think um, uh, the comment by Commodore Tompkins about what Myron was saying about workmanship and craftsmanship is very important. Uh, it's doing the job right and and having the feeling that you have done the job right. Um, so this is the other important thing that we intend to try to instill in these young people. Also, the other thing that they'll need to learn is good customer service skills. Um, you know, communication with the customer, um, doing the job right is very, very important. Um, doing the job and, and so when the owner comes, the boat is clean and tidy and exceeding the customer's expectations. So the other thing that is somewhat um, unique about this program is that the, the um, I don't like to call them students, the apprentices will be here at Spalding's. Um, they'll be running through, they'll be working in the yard alongside our, our workers, but they'll also be building mock-ups. We don't have enough work here at Spalding's to keep six people busy. So. Um, we'll be building mock-ups. Um, they'll be doing a, a wiring and plumbing and um, uh, aligning engines and all that sort of thing in, in um, primarily in mock-ups because it's, you can't have six people climbing into a 30-foot boat to align an engine. So it's going to have to be um, workshop and workbench type training. But the other thing is that's unique is that once they go through the nine months training at Spalding's, then they're going to rotate out to what we call our training partners. So these will be other boat yards, um, you know, KKMI, uh, Spencer's Bay Marine, 
um, diesel engine shops, um, all these other sorts of um, businesses around the bay, and they'll rotate out and spend a month at each one of these. And so this way they will see how things are done in other businesses and other shops, and they'll get a feel for all the, you know, hands-on with all the different expertises that's going to be available uh, for them to experience. And lastly, one of the projects is, um, this is a boat called Aroha. Uh, it is a more or less a kit boat that is being sold by Off Center Harbor. This was a, a boat designed in New Zealand and built down in New Zealand uh, by an owner builder. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful thing. And so we've actually uh, purchased the kit and is going to have this as a project uh, to be started um, and run through the nine months of the apprentices here. Um, it'll be interesting to see if we can finish the boat, but if not, the second uh, cohort of apprentices will, will finish the boat. Um, you know, we're only starting with six uh, people this first, uh, this first time, but I am hopeful that we can grow this program. There's no shortage of need. Um, so I'm hoping maybe um, the following year, rather than six, we can have 12. And hopefully the program can, can, can grow and it can prosper and become an anchor for uh, Spalding Center. Thank you very much. Great, Bill, thank you very much. It's a, a great service to the community that you have adopted uh, Spiron Center. So right off the bat, I've got to ask some questions about you. Uh, how many cruising miles do you have? I don't know, 80,000 maybe. 80,000 or so. Most of that in multi hulls No, um, I sailed as a young man. I sailed with a, a man you probably knew, um, Don Delzell. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah, of course. yeah, I sailed on Rowena a number of times, a number of passages with him. Right, um, okay. Great. Great, great guy to sail with. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, so I understand in the multi-hole, in your multi-hole heritage, there was a time when uh, something happened to the Port Ama on uh, multi-hole you were on. And I understand you were able to sail uh, maybe a thousand miles in the starboard tech to get back to San Francisco. How is that? How'd you manage that? <laughs> um, my wife calls um, the boat Defiance the Drama Queen. So we've had our, our share of, of drama. Um, yeah, the first trip back from Hawaii, um, the, uh, the boat got hit by a, very, very hard by a big wave and it, um, it cracked the planking on the Port Ama and flooded it. So uh, yeah, we had to stay on the Port Tack for the last 400 miles and um, uh, it was a it was a bit exciting. He, um, keep the keep the left side up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. As long as as long as we we're on the port tack, we had ultimate stability. You you take over at Spalding Yard in two in in two thousand fifteen. So upstairs, Myron used to have these orange crates filled with clipping from the twenties, thirties, and forties from the old orange sporting green. And there are pictures of him as a fiddler yachtsman, pictures of Myron with a, with a, a violin in arm and uh, all those stories. And they were like an incredible trove of uh, his history as an incredible, actually kind of a savant genius around these parts. Nobody would use those terms, but that's really what he was. What happened to all those clippings and all that stuff? How, are you, how have you kept that, that part of the heritage of Spalding, the art? Um, actually, a lot of it is still here. Um, it's it's a little bit better organized than it was in the past. Um, we did give a lot of his drawings, uh, designs, and um, even the keel pattern or the some of the patterns to the Maritime Museum for keeping. So um, it's all safely archived away, um, and we we still have a lot of it here. Mm -hmm. For our guests, uh, Myron was a Wednesday Yachting Luncheon speaker back in, when the Yacht Club was open on Tuesdays and was called, different name than it was called, the Tuesday Yachtsman's Luncheon. 
and he gave two talks in the 90s and uh, with, believe it or not, with 35 millimeter slides and all that. And I'll tell our, our now viewers that uh, I introduced him in, in the first talk by simply holding up a trophy, which you have in the Spalding Center. I said, everyone knows uh, our guest today, so I'm simply going to read what it says on the front of this trophy. And it says, uh, star class, season champion, um, San Francisco Bay, Myron Spalding, 1924. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody in the room fainted because the idea that he was the greatest sailor of the greatest class in San Francisco before most people were even born, that really was Myron Spaulding. And so the question is, where are, where are the yachts that he did? Uh, Chrysophily, which was a famous boat in the Dean Morrison days, was all around. Where is Chrysophily? Where is Nautical? The last guy that owned it tonight was Joe Koopman. So where are those two boats and how many other Spaulding craft are still around and about? Unfortunately, Chrysophily was sold a couple of years ago and I, and she was purchased by a fellow that knew what he was looking at. And I, uh, I think she's in Australia now. Uh, Not a gal is owned by Robbie Robinson and is over in um, Richmond and he sails it frequently. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, but he moved it from Corinthian Yacht Club, which is where Koopman had it. Those boys had it for 30 or 40 years. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's in Point Richmond. What about Spalding 33s? How many of those are still around? I don't know. Um, there, we see a few of them. We had one out in the yard just recently. Um, so I know there's two or three around, but I don't really keep track of them. About your uh, programs, what are hours of operation of Spalding Works these days? When can people come by? The yard is open from 7.30 to 3.30. Um, Unfortunately, we're really not inviting the public in right at this time. I mean, okay. if somebody wants to talk about a haul out or something, or they have some business, we're happy to let them in. But normally, uh, and we're hopefully going back to normal soon, um, the door is open and we welcome people into the center to come in and walk around and visit the library or look at the artifacts. And um, we'll, we'll be back there soon. It is interesting in the era of social media, and here this is a Zoom call, you guys stopped what was a wonderfully social set of events. You were having little concerts and you were having speaker series, wonderful, and uh, lots of social events at, at your center. Um, so how can people help now? Well, <laughs> money, of course, uh, is always a big help. Um, we are- one c 3 so they can give money to the Spalding Center, so they can make a donation to your 501c3. The other thing is, is that um, we, we do have um, openings for volunteers to come in and help out. If you want to build a Pelican, we've, uh, we're have we getting a list of people to help with that project. So there's always things to be done around here. If you want to uh, work on Frida or sail Frida, um, she's, she's available. Um, um, so there's always things. Um, even if you just want to come in and sweep the floor, it's always welcome. <laughs> so how many students are you going to start out with six apprentice students? Is that the beginning of the program? And when do yes. you plan to do that? We're going to start taking applications in March and we'll make our selections. And then uh, the program will start August 15th. How many hours of classwork are you imagining in the program over how many years? Well, uh, they're going to be here. This is, the thing about an apprentice program, this is a job. So they're gonna, they need to show up. We're gonna run eight to four for the um, uh, apprentices and um, 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to go for nine months. And mm -hmm. then they will rotate out to our partner employers, employers and work and rotate and do a month at each. We're not going to abandon them. We'll, we'll, we'll be basically mentoring and checking in with our uh, employer partners to make sure everything's on track. So they'll basically work in a partner yard and then they'll come back to you guys again or they'll go to another partner yard? What's the plan? No, they'll go to another partner yard or mm -hmm. employer because it might, instead of a yard, it might be a, a mechanical engine, engine shop or it could be a, a company that does um, electrical or systems but they will go to another partner employer. What's a ballpark that you're imagining the apprentices are going to get paid? 
Well, it's actually quite generous. And the reason being it's generous is because um, we are registered with the uh, Department of Apprenticeship Standards. And uh, we have to pay a certain amount based on uh, what the journeyman wage would be. So they're, they're going to get started out at a fairly generous $20 an hour. Great, 20 bucks an hour. And what do you, how long do you think an apprenticeship program would be? How many years? What's your plan? Our plan is, is nine months here, uh, six months rotation, and then out, out in the workforce. So Bill, you sold the company that you built up, uh, Spectrum Water worked, and then you uh, had a perfectly good cruising life going on. Why did you decide to take on the Spalding Center? Um, good question. Insanity, I suppose. Um, I've always loved this place. Um, you know, the industry has been good to me. It was a way to give back something. Uh -huh. You know, your idea about, um, boat work 101, uh, uh, that's a very, very fun. First of all, it's a good title. Good name says a lot and uh, it says it's current. And, uh, it's interesting because it's, solving a business problem too. There's a need for young craftsmen in the industry. So uh, congratulations, you know, on uh, identifying a thoughtful business purpose for what is otherwise, uh, you know, an artsy, wonderful cultural contribution that you're making to the community. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, we at the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon applaud the effort wholeheartedly and enthusiastically uh, support it and uh, want to be as helpful as we possibly can and want to encourage uh, those who might be interested in supporting you to uh, recognize that a 501c3 is a tax deductible uh, organization, thus any contribution is tax deductible and it's for a thoughtful good cause. How are you targeting the candidates? Uh, what kind of demographic profile are you hunting for for people to bring into the program? We're working with a number of what's called workforce development boards. Mm -hmm. And um, they are organizations, they're all over the Bay Area. Um, and they um, are, they have a number of young people that they are looking to find good employment for. Um, and, you know, we're, our demographic that we're looking for are those young people coming out of high school that they're not necessarily candidates for college. They, they may be ambitious. They may, um, you know, have good mechanical skills, but they, they're just not suited for college, or maybe they don't have the funds for college. So this is the demographic we're looking for. Um, and with the workforce development boards, um, they will bring um, candidates. Um, and also they help bring some funding to the program because it's a substantial uh, cost to employ these people uh, when they're really not producing income type work. So for those who don't know, Ron Anderson built the biggest boat yard in the Bay Area and uh, in Sausalito, not too far from Spalding now. And Ron did not go to college at all. He worked for Hank Isom, who was an incredible topside painter brilliantly great craftsman and he had a nose for business and he started the anderson boatyard and built it to be a very big business so one doesn't need to uh, shake one's head about the fact that people who don't go to college uh, can make good businesses and be tremendously good uh, craftsmen so uh, we applaud your energy there and see you quite a good you know it's a contribution to the culture and uh, to the community. So thanks very much, Bill, uh, for being our guest at the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Uh, it's been our pleasure to host you guys here and we wish you all the very best of luck for Spalding and for Boatworks 101. Thank thanks. you so much, Ron, appreciate it. Our pleasure. Our pleasure, thanks, buddy.
This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.